Now that you've watched the lectures, you've been introduced to all of the specific hormones in this chapter. Now would be a good time to go back and cover some of these general characteristics of endocrine system and ask which of the specific hormones these characteristics apply to and which ones they don't. For instance, which hormones are water soluble versus lipid soluble and what does this have to do with the location of the hormone receptor proteins. Once you've done that, reviewing the specifics of each hormone system should be easier. Addison's disease was an excellent example of a complex negative feedback loop. In this disease, the adrenals are not producing enough corticosteroids, and this relieves the negative feedback that those corticosteroids would have on the hypothalamus. As a result, this will increase production of CRH from the hypothalamus, which increases production of ACTH from the pituitary. And ACTH can increase production of the corticosteroids, therefore relieving the deficiency. However, ACTH is not made on its own. It comes from a precursor molecule called POMC. So CRH increases POMC production, and POMC is produced and snipped into three parts, one of which is the ACTH that we need, another part is MSH, and a third is an endogenous opiate. So with increased ACTH levels, we also get increased MSH levels. And that MSH travels through the body, activating melanocytes and this leads to a darkening of the skin. This is how Addison's disease is diagnosed, because it's much easier to see an abnormal darkening of the skin than it is to see a deficiency in the production of corticosteroids from the adrenal glands. The various effects of the hormone oxytocin illustrated a number of key concepts about hormone signaling. For instance, oxytocin does not trigger the letdown reflex unless the breast tissue has been primed by the hormone prolactin. This is an example of hormones having a permissive role on other hormones. Furthermore, the levels of oxytocin release were also important, as is the number of receptor proteins found in various organs. This can explain how oxytocin has different effects in response to different stimuli. As blood glucose levels rise, this will trigger the pancreas to secrete the hormone insulin. Insulin can bind to insulin receptors found on many cells throughout the body. This will trigger the movement of glucose transporters to the plasma membrane, which will then remove glucose from the blood and bring it into the cell to be used as energy or stored as some form of macromolecule thereby lowering blood glucose. For people whose blood glucose is chronically elevated, this leads to chronic production of insulin. Over time, this chronic insulin will lead to receptor down regulation, where cells become less sensitive to insulin. Because of this, the cells are less capable of removing glucose from the bloodstream. This increased blood glucose will then cause the pancreas to secrete even more insulin. This will make the disease progressively worse. And of course, the disease that we are discussing is type 2 or adult onset diabetes. So with this condition, we see elevated blood glucose as well as elevated insulin levels and decreased numbers of insulin receptors on our target organs, such as the liver and muscle. Type 2 diabetes is an excellent illustration of why we should not focus strictly on the levels of hormones in the bloodstream when we are diagnosing patients. We would not say that those elevated insulin levels seen in type 2 diabetes makes these people extra healthy or extra not diabetic. We need to consider the entire signaling pathway not just the levels of the last hormone when deciding whether a patient is healthy or not. For instance, the hypothalamus can make the hormone TRH, 
which tells the pituitary to make the hormone TSH, which tells the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormones can bind to thyroid hormone receptors, causing a number of different effects throughout the body. If a patient has more thyroid hormone receptors, or their hormone receptors are very sensitive, it may take lower levels of thyroid hormone to initiate an effect. This includes activating the negative feedback on the hypothalamus, decreasing TRH levels. Conversely, if a person has low levels of thyroid hormone receptors, or their receptors are not very sensitive, it may take even greater amounts of thyroid hormone to activate the same level of signaling. This means higher levels of thyroid hormone will be necessary before TRH production in the hypothalamus is shut down. Nevertheless, for somebody who has very sensitive thyroid hormone receptors or very insensitive thyroid hormone receptors, if there isn't enough thyroid hormone, that will trigger elevated levels of TRH, which increases production of TSH. So seeing high levels of those two hormones in the bloodstream is a sign that somebody is deficient in their thyroid hormone levels, no matter what those levels are. Be sure you review the hormones that we've already covered. For instance, the skin could produce MSH in response to UV exposure, as well as inflammatory molecules in response to damage. Bone tissue could respond to calcitonin and PTH, and muscle tissue could produce testosterone and growth hormone in response to exercise and inflammation.